since the panel is uh, dealing with the topic of the U.S. and the Israeli elections, I want to pose the following question to the panelists to, uh, to address. I think it goes to the heart of the matter. I think as uh, everyone who has spoken on this panel and on the previous panels would agree, American support for Israel is absolutely pivotal uh, in every large and small sense one can imagine. Um, having said that, a report came out from the Pew Research Center for People in the Press six days ago. It's gen dated January 8th. You can get it on the web. Uh, the title is, As Hegel Fight Begins, Wide Partisan Differences in Support for Israel. The piece is not about Hegel. It's about American support for Israel. And it's paradoxical. On the one hand, it finds consistency in American support for Israel. If anything, taken in the aggregate, support for Israel is as high as it's ever been, probably across the last four decades or so. In the December uh, panel, 50% of US adults said they sympathized more with Israel. Just 10% sympathized more with the Palestinians. 13% sympathized with neither side. If you were addressing this question uh, from the standpoint of US Israel relations, you'd say, so far, so good. What's a matter of concern, however, is when you disaggregate those numbers. Um, and I want to ask each of the panelists, not least um, uh, Robert Wexler, because you've been a, a, an active Paul, and you've been a Democrat, and I think a liberal Democrat. The, when you break this down, what you find is a growing partisan difference in support for Israel, making it more of a partisan issue than it has ever been. Uh, Michael Oren, who was here for, we had him here for the Program for Jewish Civilization for a year before he went into the uh, position he now holds as ambassador of Israel to the United States. Um, ambassador Oren had made the point how critical it was to maintain support for Israel and not have it be a partisan issue. Well, the figures on the Pew study and these are also consistent with other polling reports, are the following. In December, 70% of Republicans sympathized with more, more, more with Israel, while just 2% with the Palestinians. Uh, about 4 in 10 Democrats, 41% sympathized more with Israel, and 13% sympathized with the Palestinians. That's a gap between uh, the parties it's still the good news, I suppose, for Israel is um, on both parties, you have a significant margin for Israel. But there is a 29-point partisan gap between the two parties. Moreover, if you pursue the numbers still further into the deep weeds, what you find is that among liberal Democrats, the margin is still, I mean, the, um, uh, the support for Israel is less, uh, less positive compared to those numbers I've given you. Still on average favorable, but less so. And among younger uh, voters, um, you get some attrition as well. I'd like each of the panelists to respond to that issue, to what extent it's a concern in uh, Israel, and uh, what may influence how those uh, opinions play out in the coming years on both the US side and the Israeli side. Let's go back in the same order with Mr. Gutman, with David, and then with Robert Wexler. Thanks, I just want to offer a few thoughts on that. First of all, does it play out in Israel at all? I don't think the Israeli public is aware of this divide. I think in the face of the United States that Israeli sees uh, is the face of the President, of Congress, that are overwhelmingly supportive of Israel. And I'm not sure Israelis are aware of these different trends within the US public. I also think that it does represent um, a certain disconnect between um, political leadership, at least on the Democratic side, and the grassroots, and if you look in pro-Israel resolutions in, in Congress, Democrats overwhelmingly support them, or Democrats usually lead these issues. Um, still, there are parts of their constituency that aren't on board, but I think the main reason is that in, in recent years, we, we've seen a shift in the definition of what it means to be pro-Israel. And in, especially in the past in three or four years, since in supporting uh, 
uh, an elaborate U.S. push for uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace in, has become an anti-Israel issue, I think those Democrats that support a peace process find it harder to define themselves as pro-Israeli now. I would say, look, the real shift in the United States, it seems to me, it came uh, at the late 80s, mid-90s, when the evangelical community that defined its main foreign policy priority and during the Cold War as anti-communism, communism as atheism. Once the Cold War ended, I think they were looking for a signature foreign policy issue, and that became Israel. And so if you take, let's say, two people with the same name, George Bush, one is H.W., and the other is W. Bush, the father's Republican Party was much more of a country club Republican Party. And I think that some of the names that, you know, uh, we, you know the, we heard around the Hegel debate, um, Scowcroft, Hegel, Powell, these were people that were very much at home in that party. I think as the party took a more of an evangelical turn, uh, you know, the, the people in it took turns. You know, now you would see a Lindsey Graham a much more of a spokesman of that party. And so the net effect is, is that there's been an overall shift in the United States. Now, I don't think it's just the Republican-Democrat, though, thing, too. I think you've got, it's across the country, you have this widespread support. It's kind of like Dickens, you know. These are the best of times, but are these the worst of times? Because I think, I mean, I see it in Washington and in, 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 in the Washington-New York corridor, is that a lot of opinion shapers um, you know, who are columnists, maybe maybe not names you would have heard of either, who are editorial writers, because they, they don't put their names in the paper, but their views have shifted in Israel in the other direction because they are uncomfortable with the turn of the Israeli government. So I think what we're seeing is, on one hand, a widespread greater support going back to the end of the 80s and certainly, uh, you know, reaching you know, really high points with 9-11 uh, and American attitudes uh, towards uh, the Middle East after 9-11 and that are continue to this day in terms of grassroots and a political elite that is less comfortable with Israel. And so both phenomena are happening simultaneously. So for Israel, there's the best of times and it's the worst of times because on the elite level, and I go, uh, Rafael Omari is here, we've been... I've been up to 52 campuses, and uh, we didn't take polls at every campus, but we see the change among some academics, too. So I think these, these are twin phenomena that are happening, and uh, both are happening at the same time. I, I, I think both gentlemen are correct. I, I would take it a step further, even. Um, first of all, the, the takeaway from this poll is the vast majority of Americans are profoundly pro-Israel in every way. And that, to me, is a wonderful thing. Now, on doubt, I, I have no doubt some of my Republican friends would argue differently, but this has nothing to do, quite frankly, with the Democratic or the Republican Party. What this has to do is with the demographics of America. And the fact is the Republican Party today is a largely white, more older American party. The Democratic Party is a less white party made up of of course, very large constituencies like the Latino community, the African American community, the Asian American community, and a whole lot of younger Americans of all ethnicities and, and the like. And those groups of Americans, having nothing to do with Democratic Party or Republican Party, have different life experiences and life perspectives. I use my own home as an example. Um, I'm 52 years old. Uh, the, the, the first real experience I remember from, from Israeli news was the raid on Entebbe that I was old enough to understand. Well, that was a black and white issue. The Israelis were 100% good and the other guys were 100% bad. It was easy for me. My three children, it's not so easy. It's not 100% good and 100% bad. Now, I would argue they're just as pro-Israel as I am, but their perspective is different. 
and I suspect their perspective might show up in a poll. Now, what should we take from this? Two things. First of all, the demographics of both Israel and America have changed dramatically. Like Nathan was talking about the different elections, but those elections happened before a million Russians showed up in Israel. The demographics of Israel are far different than they were 20 years ago when Rabin was at his strength. And the demographics of America today are far different than they were even 10 or 12 years ago. And to my Israeli friends, I would offer this observation. Barack Obama, President Obama, is not an anomaly. He's not just the first and only president to look different than all the other presidents. He's probably the first president of many that are likely to look quite different than the previous presidents. And if Israel is going to maintain its extraordinary bond of friendship with America, then Israel needs to take a hard look at the demographics of America and begin to consider those demographics as it makes its own policies and its choices and its use of words. And I'll give one more example, if I may, in a very personal way, and my son probably wouldn't be happy with me. But my son, who attended a Jewish day school, went to Israel for a semester in his senior year. He was at a Shabbat dinner at a home in a town in Israel. And as soon as Shabbat was over, he called me and said, Daddy, you're not going to believe the dinner conversation that I just sat through. And he described a dinner conversation, no doubt wonderful people, I have no doubt. But the manner in which they expressed themselves, Jewish Israelis, about racial issues, my 19-year-old son, or at that time 17 years old, could not relate at all. And he said to me, Daddy, if I ever use the words that the teenager at that table used, we would have an amazingly hard problem in our house. But the other father didn't say a word. I don't want to use an anecdote and extrapolate from something more than should. But there is a big disconnect in terms of what younger Americans think is just and proper and right and what young Israelis think is just, proper, and right. And no doubt, young Americans growing up in Boca Raton, Florida, or Maryland, or wherever else, have a very different experience than a younger Israeli who grew up formative years during the Intifada. I'm not discounting that. But these are the issues of demographics that both those of us who care about the American-Israeli bond on both the American side and the Israeli side should, be, should consider. I want to follow up with a question to all of you, starting with Robert Wexler, um, which pushes on this. Speaking of disconnects, there's a disconnect between what the polling data, not just in this survey, but in others, have shown, which is that people who identify themselves as liberals or Democrats um, still provide a should still show a plurality supporting Israel. But depending on the polling sample, the definition, and so on, it's a diminishing number. And yet, when I talk to my acquaintances on Capitol Hill, they tell me that, by and large, by every indicator, Democratic members of the House and Senate remain overwhelmingly pro-Israel. A little bit of attrition in the House, but not much. So that, in that sense, uh, congressmen and senators remain more, uh, and here I'm talking about Democrats now, remain um, a good deal more strongly pro-Israel than those who identify as liberals or Democrats in the public as a whole. My question uh, first to Congressman Wexler and then to all of you, um, does that portend trouble or is it a more a matter that for an awful lot of people to whom this question is posed, it doesn't have high salience, it's just something tossed off and that therefore the opinions of congressmen and senators are more durable and uh, that therefore there is, is less concern. Let's start with that. Again, beginning with Congressman Wexler, then David, then Nathan. I don't think it portrays trouble. Actually, I think in many respects it's a credit to the Jewish American community, the American Jewish community. Uh, it's a highly engaged political community and it takes great effort to educate public officials at the state level, at the federal level, and so forth. And my own personal view is the good news for Israel, at least from an American perspective, is that largely the truth sells. Um, that's the good news for Israel. 
that there's a truthful discussion that can be had in an honest and open way in America, and the vast majority of Americans will relate to and endorse the Israeli posture and position. And so that's the good news. The challenging news is when you break down the demographics, take the African American community, for instance, and I'm not an expert, but if you look at members of Congress and elected officials and so forth, if you're talking to an African American gentleman or gentle lady who is my age, 52 or older, largely their formative experiences, particularly those that are 60 and up, with the Jewish community were based on the civil rights movement. And those initial perceptions and initial relationships were immensely positive. Their sons and their daughters may not have had that perspective. Likewise, in the Latino community, there are different perspectives. Their interactions with the American Jewish community and different members have been quite different. But take President Obama, for instance, as an individual. He talks quite eloquently about as a young man, as a young lawyer, as a young professor, as a, as a community organizer, his interactions with members of the Jewish community in Chicago and so forth as being his formative relationships and why he has such a positive and enduring empathy with the Jewish people in the state of Israel. That's where relationships are made. Those dynamics are changing. And that's not troubling to me. That's the challenge. Smart people on all sides of this relationship will seek to engender the kind of dynamic that results in a positive frame of reference rather than a negative one. The problem that we have, or the challenge, is that things such as what appear to be, from an American perspective, religious intolerance, or stridency on social issues, uh, a questioning whether somebody's religiousness qualifies at a certain level to be this or that, most Americans do not, are not comfortable with those questions. David? Well, these are all very interesting points, I mean, that Robert is making, because, I mean, I think he's hitting on something which is really True, I, I was happened to have a very, I happened to be out last week uh, with the new freshman class of, of members of Congress uh, in Williamsburg, Virginia, sponsored by the Congressional Research Service. I'm not allowed to talk about the substance, except that it was a very <laughs> wonderful experience. Uh, and I think it hits on something that Robert is saying, is that it's easier sometimes for a, a certain generation of, of legislators to relate to the American Jewish community because they see in them basically a, a, a pretty centrist community that are not at the edges of any sort of social debate or political debate. But I think sometimes they don't have that same level of interaction with Israel. I, I, that scares me a bit, that, that in the 80s and the 90s, you know, Rabin, uh, Dan Meridor, Ehud Olmert, there were a lot of American, uh, a lot of Israeli leaders, uh, and you still have congressional people going back and forth, don't get me wrong, they do, but common success stories where, uh, that brought these countries together, uh, I think it is a problem when you don't have the same success stories to tell, and it bothers me when a Condoleezza Rice, you know, when she talks about the Palestinian issue, she compares it to the Old South uh, and said, I was growing up in Montgomery, Alabama, and I saw this was the way that we could deal with this issue this way or that way, and that informs my thinking. And I'm not saying she's alone in thinking that way, whether she's a Republican or a Democrat, but I don't want people's association of the Israeli-Palestinian to, to, be, to be refracted through the prism of, of, of blacks in the South. And this, I am concerned about it, and I, when I, there's not enough interactions, uh, U.S. and Israeli interactions, genuine interactions, and you can say, look, the American Jewish community is there, they can relate to American Jews easier than they can relate to Israelis. I do think that it's important that uh, we can't always count on the fact that the American Jews are going to be there in that relationship uh, in the same way. So I think it's very important to get members of Congress to visit Israel, of course, and to get Israelis to visit here. But I, I'm concerned about some of the, the parallels that are being raised 
uh, by leaders, maybe some not consciously, but I, I think that is scary. I think there are a lot of differences with the South of the 1960s. Um, the Palestinian issue wouldn't be like this if we, you know, if Yasser Arafat was Martin Luther King, they would be celebrating their 50th anniversary of a Palestinian state by now. But anyway. Nathan, did you want to add uh, anything to this? Just to add um, to the issue of, uh, of where the American Jewish community plays into this uh, in the discussion, uh, because as Congressman Wexler said, the, the, the American Jewish community is the main conveyor of the issue of Israel to the American public. And in the past, it was easier because American Jewish life had to do with civil rights, with the, in liberal values. So in a sense, for those rank and file liberals, those who are not in Congress and do not get exposed to this advocacy every day, um, for the rank and file um, liberals, um, Jewish American equaled liberal values, and therefore it was easier for them to see Israel as part of this package of, of liberal values. Since the Jewish community shifted more towards focus on Israel in its discourse, um, these uh, liberal issues were, were set aside. And therefore, um, when, when you think, uh, when, when you try to associate the Israel, it doesn't necessarily, uh, uh, um, what comes to mind isn't necessarily liberal values. On the, on the contrary, most people would, would associate it with non-liberal values. And that's, that's in part, in part it has to do with this shift in the, in the focus of the Jewish community. Hey, can I just add something sure. quick? Um, maybe in a little bit lighter note. I, I laughed last week. Uh, Jack Lou uh, is a dear friend of mine, and I think he's one of, if not the finest public servant that our nation has ever been blessed to have devoted to, to service of, to our nation. And I laughed immensely last week. Jack Lou is a orthodox, observant Jewish man. And when President Obama chose him to be, nominated him to be Treasury Secretary, he was portrayed as yet just another white man. And I sat back and I said, my God, this country has gone to such a far place where a Orthodox Jew is portrayed as yet just another white man that doesn't represent any diversity whatsoever. I don't know what that had to do with the discussion. but. Um, it's just how far America has come. And, and when Seinfeld is as popular in Kansas, the reruns, as they are in New York City, that also tells you something. It's a terrific point.